The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. We're focusing on learning. This is the time to learn. I've got a great video for you today. Cesar Santos and the Secrets of Portrait Painting. The story behind this is I asked Cesar to go copy a Bouguereau painting and learn everything he could about Bouguereau. He studied it, painted for months and months and months, and then of course took what he has already known and applied it to this fabulous video. I hope you enjoy this segment. Hi, we're back on day two. Uh, yesterday we did the drawing, we went to the dead coloring stage. But now before I get started on my um, first painting, my second day uh, layers, I'm gonna go over an article that was written by Lindsay Harkness. It's called, When Seeing Isn't Necessarily Believing. And I think this is important. It was written a couple of, a few years back. And I think this is very important because we think that we can see stuff, but we are not made to see as painters. And in this article, it's interesting because they, there were scientific uh, um, elements involved in this article. It's not just artistic, so that's why I think it's important. And what they did, they did a study, and they measured the light from the sun, the brightest, you know, which is the sunlight, to the darkest from uh, uh, deep in a cave at night. In nature, they counted the intensity steps, levels, like a grayscale of light in nature, and they counted 10 billion intensity steps from that darkness inside the cave at night to the brightest of the sun. And um, they measured, comparing the eye of a human, how many steps we can um, judge as humans. And when they measured the existing range in nature to our visual range, they, uh, we, they found that we can only discriminate 1,000 intensity steps in those 10 billion. So if you think about it, we're practically blind. And uh, how, you know, um, our biology can make that mistake. But the thing is that nature solves it really in a very uh, interesting way. What it does is that Every time you encounter a field of vision and you focus um, your eye in some place, that uh, those 1,000 1, steps divide themselves in that field of vision. And then you adjust them so then you can see darker stuff and lighter stuff around your focal point. For instance, if you're late in the evening and you're walking outside, the sun is getting, uh, everything is getting dark, and you look inside a house, inside a window, everything looks like a, just a white thing inside. But outside, you're actually walking, you can see the ground, you can see some leaves, you can see maybe an animal, because your 1,000 steps um, gradation is divided in that field of vision. Now, inside the house, you couldn't see details, you just see a white square in the window. But the people inside the house are adapting their 1,000 steps to their environment. That means that they can see details in the, you know, on the table, on the plate, the ceramic plate with the highlight on it, and all those things uh, you, you know, you're capable of seeing just because you're dividing that 1,000 steps that you have in that field of vision. What I mean by this is, if you're painting, and you don't know this, and you don't have uh, control of this, when you're painting and you look at the model, and you focus, let's say, uh, on the hair, you look at the hair, it's dark hair, we can see, if you focus right directly on the hair, you will see highlights. You can see a lot of highlights, a lot of uh, details. 
But as a painter, you cannot be painting that like that because if you look at the background and you see highlights, darker lights, then you see, look at the hair, look at that. Then you look at the shadow, see all these variations. And your range of color is not 1,000 steps like we have in nature. So they're much more limited. So if you, if you don't um, group them together, if you don't know this, your painting is gonna be light and dark all over the place. And that is when you don't see that uh, dignity, that elegance um, in a lot of painters that don't control these values. So as an artist, you have to say, okay, I know this is a, a biological problem that we have, that we tend to look at an area and see lights and darks everywhere, even if it's a black cloth or a white cloth. So for that reason, you have to force yourself to um, simplify those values and group them together, especially at the beginning. That's what I did uh, in the last uh, painting session. I said, okay, the background is gonna be one value, the hair, one value, the, the light of the face, one value. And that means that I'm forcing myself, I'm tricking my in, um, innate uh, tendency to see all these variations. When I'm painting, someone pass by, they see the forehead as being only one value and they say, no, but I see all these little things and uh, the birthmark and the little pink on the side and the little green. Yes, I know we see that, but because of that factor, we have to force ourselves to be, to be very, um, to simplify all these values. So I think that's very important and uh, let's keep it in mind throughout the whole painting process. But that was especially important for this stage that we just completed, okay? Okay, so here's the palette I'm gonna be using for the first painting stage. Remember, we did the drawing, we did the dead coloring stage. I um, went through the palette that I used yesterday. And this is for the second day. It's our first painting stage. Meaning that um, today we're gonna look at more subtleties in, in color. Yesterday we were looking at values, so we were not focusing that much into color. We're just setting ourselves up creating a nice kind of surface to paint on. Well, that's today. But one thing we're not doing today, it's we're not gonna be rendering uh, the form. We're not gonna be describing texture. We're just gonna be finding volume, drawing, and the right color. So it's pretty much gonna be a mosaic effect, kind of just like uh, patches of colors that describe the whole, um, the head, of, the whole painting. All right, so this time, as you see here, we have a little bit more color than yesterday. I'm gonna be explaining all these um, tints that I've created here, but they all this might look um, kind of complicated, but it really comes from these colors here and uh, this black over here. So first we have uh, titanium white, the one I mentioned yesterday, this is uh, Winsor & Newton uh, Griffin Alkyd. That is a fast drying titanium white. After that, we have a uh, light red. That is this color. It's called light red. It's made by Winsor & Newton. It's the base for flesh. After that, we have yellow ochre pale. It's a little bit... Uh, my tubes are <laughs> kind of uh, used a lot, so you know they're not pretty looking. But it's yellow ochre per pale from uh, Winsor and Newton. Then after it's raw umber. Also, my raw umber comes from Winsor and Newton. They kind of changed the design of the tubes recently, so this is why it looks a little different than the other ones. But it's uh, raw umber. After that, we have. Canyon red, that's the brightest red you want to be using. You have to be careful, you don't want to use it too much in the flesh because it's really high chroma. Um, so, canyon red. Don't get canyon red hue or any, you know, canyon red, you know, tint or something like that because those tend to be of a low quality. Uh, they sometimes are cheaper, but be careful, just get the canyon red because it has a lot of pigments in it and it's, uh, th that's what you need. Now, the, w the way I select brands 
uh, it's first because that's how I learn at the Angel Academy. So I kind of get used to what you learn uh, to do. But also, for instance, if you, I don't have an example here, but if you have, uh, some people like the Canyon Red from Old Holland, for instance, which is more expensive than this brand. But not always the price it, uh, tells you about the quality or, or the, you know, the best choice to choose a color. For instance, this red, where, if I ask you where will you need this type of, of bright red? In the shadows or more in the lights? You probably say in the lights. Well, that's correct. In the lights because it's a very bright color, bright red, so it's most useful in the lights. So what do you want the red to do? To be a lighter value. So this red, for what it is, is a lighter value than the Old Holland Canyon Red, which comes a little darker. And uh, maybe it has more pigments in it, maybe it's better quality, but just because it's darker, it's not serving me uh, what I need it for. That's how I choose. Like if I, if I'm, if I need a uh, yellow, also yellow is something we use in the lights. So if it comes out of the tube in a lighter version, then I, I tend to pick that one. Our next color, it's uh, ultramarine blue. This comes uh, from Old Holland, makes this tube. So I rather use uh, this ultramarine from Old Holland because it has a lot more pigmentation in it. It's more, uh, stronger. So that is that color. And then the green I use is uh, Terra Verde. So this green is this color over here. Following that, I have Mars Brown. Now Mars Brown is uh, from Old Holland. So the, the blue was from Old Holland and this Mars Brown is from Old Holland. You can make this uh, very similar to this color by mixing what we mixed uh, in the shadows yesterday, which was this uh, raw umber and uh, light red and a little bit of white makes kind of a similar to that. But I kind of like it out of the tube because it has a little bit more punch to it. It's uh, stronger. Plus it's there, I don't have to mix it. After that Mars Brown, I have Indian Red, also from Winsor & Newton. Indian Red, I put it next to the black because I'm not gonna be mixing it in the lights. This color, it's not like the other reds. Light red is a good base for the flesh, but Indian red, it's not. So it's, I just use it, it has a lot of tinting power. So I put it next to the black, just to increase the chroma uh, in the darks, to have like warmer darks. And lastly, we have ivory black. Ivory black is the same as my, my titanium white. It, it comes from Winsor & Newton. It's a Griffin Alkyd, and it's a fast-drying <coughs> fast drying, uh, ivory black because normally whites and blacks are pretty uh, slow dryers, especially, especially ivory black. So I want to make sure it dries fast today too because I'm going to do this demo in three consecutive days. I cannot afford to come here and have a wet um, surface. Now, as you can see here, I have showing you what I, uh, the colors that I'll be using for the flesh. Now, the blue and the green, I won't use, uh, I just put them here because I realized that the hair piece that I'm painting has different colors. So I just have them, I have these two colors there to kind of reference to that and, and do that part. But um, mostly I'm just gonna be using from the white here to the red and a little bit of, of, the, of the darks here, the black and the Indian red, but not these two colors, okay? So all the mixtures here are gonna, are gonna be out of the same thing we said yesterday. White, if you're mixing a light color, it's better if you bring the white first. Some people know that the, the mixture is, let's say, light red and white, and you start getting light red and then getting white. No, be organized about it. Bring white first because it's lighter and then add to that white uh, color until you get what you want. That way you don't have a, bit, a bunch of color that you're not gonna be using. So in this case, I put the white, light red, and a little bit of yellow. Mix it up to a nice flesh. And just observe your flesh or the model's flesh, you know? Look at your, look at your hands 
and see how close to it, it is uh, to it, you know, study it. Uh, we do that with still lifes. You kind of go up and match the color. You can do that with flesh. The thing is that with flesh, it's not, we're not a mannequin. It's not one color that you can mix for that. It's a bunch of different hues and temperatures playing together. But uh, that's why we have a variation here of tints. And tint is just a term, I mean, you can look it up, but uh, tint is a term to um, have white introduced into a color. So it tints it down. It's, uh, it's different than a, than a shade, which is more uh, adding black to a color. Okay, so um, all this, if you see, the important thing is that you control the chroma. The lightest thing has higher chroma, and as I go down in value, I lower a little bit the chroma, lower, lower, until I have like pretty much kind of a gray towards the end. So I decided to do these five mixtures here, uh, and this will go from the lights kind of to the darkest half tones. Remember, my shadow, it's over here, and that was made from um, raw umber, light red, and a little bit of white. That was my base for my shadows. Now here, I have a mix, pre-mix also, uh, some tints, a little bit darker, just to be, remember, you want to have the play between the high chromas and the cool, and the low chromas around it. I decided to have a base of flesh. This color was made also, same, white, adding light red to it, and a little bit of yellow to a little bit darker value than this, you see? The only difference is that, I don't, here, this color is lower chroma than this, so it works for my scaling down, but that would work just if it was a mannequin or something beige. But since it's flesh, I want to have kind of like a higher chroma and a little bit darker than this, just to, to see a variation and see where I can put it. I have an, uh, um, a cool color next to it, a little bit darker, but not so much, but just very much cooler. Like the difference between value is not as much as the difference in hue. This you say is more like a greenish, like a gray, and this is more like an uh, orangey color, pink. And then I have a darker, higher chroma again, kind of like the sec, if this was one in, um, in color, in hue, then this color has same base, white, light red, and instead of adding this yellow, which is light, I use another type of yellow, which is raw umber. We went through it yesterday. It's in the yellow family, because if it's mixed with the blue, it makes a greenish color. So then I add um, raw umber to it to darken it and have it um, higher chroma. Then I have a version of that. You see these two here? It's kind of like, if this is uh, this to this is as this to that, meaning high chroma value uh, number three. I'm gonna explain the values now since I'm talking about it. For instance, <clears throat> this you don't want to have even the highlights in the flesh have some color. You don't want never ha want to have pure white on the flesh or close to it. Um, the flesh is gonna look light because you're gonna put dark around it. So, if you, if you look at the scale, let me put it like this. If you look at the scale here, we can see that this starts from a kind of like a number four, then five, six, and you don't, wanna, you don't wanna use the black because the black is all the way over here. So you wanna keep it in the range between seven and four, seven and three kind of range, okay? And if you see the variation of values in this second uh, section of, of premixed colors, that is a little bit more uh, close together, closer family. So we see, let's say this one is about, this one is a value four. You see, if we put, oh, and the value scale I'm using goes from one, pure white, to nine. From one which is, to nine, which is black. I choose nine and not 10, why? Because I can get a middle tone, uh, tone which is exactly in the middle. So we have 
one, two, three, four to this side, and one, two, three, four to that side. So I know that five will be my exact middle value there. Okay, so when I get close to my tints, I see the five is a little darker. Maybe shadow is, uh, I'm gonna put it like this. So I can see the five is a little darker than this tint over here, and four is a little bit closer. You see, three is a little bit lighter, so four. Then when we go to the second one, it's just five. So this, the jump from here to here is one, is one value uh, range difference. Then here you can see that it's light, so that's a number six. You see what I'm saying? So this color is a number six and it's a high chroma. And the first color is a number four and it's higher chroma. So these two go to their versions of grays. So from here to here and from here to here, we can see that we went from um, a six to a seven there. See? Then I have mixed um, one just before the shadow. Just This color is just going to be used right towards the edge uh, between the shadow and, and the darkest lights, okay? Now, these pinks that I have here, I've created a version of this pinker for like, you know, uh, around the face and the nose, places that I see as warmer, they have more blood uh, in them, so they become pinker. And now this color is pretty much the same flesh color, so the base, you get the white, light red, yellow, and then add to this canyon red. And that's how you increase the chroma, make it more uh, pinker, redder. And then we do the same thing and do a darker version because on one side of the face, closer to the light, it's gonna be higher chroma and lighter. And then next to it, on the other side, you don't wanna use the same color because it's too light. Remember, we're talking about a surface that is round and you want to make sure that in, uh, in context they look pink. So what you do is you mix the same value as your darkest lights and you, you put canyon red to it to make it pinker. And then I just have a really high chroma dark here that is uh, made out of uh, black and Indian red. Remember, Indian red, you don't mix in any of the lights, you just use it to increase the chroma of the darks. And that's what these two are about. And finally, what I did here was I just added white to the black and did three mixtures of gray. Remember, if you want to gray any of these colors, if you're mixing any flesh color and you want to gray it down, don't bring the black immediately because you're not gonna know how it's going to change the value of it. So make sure you pre-mix a gray, the same value that you need it, and you add it into it, okay? It's pretty much common sense. None of this is like, you know, rocket science, really. And the medium, the medium I'm using for this stage, for the first painting stage, has more oil. Of course, yesterday we didn't use um, oil at all other than the oil that comes in the tubes with the paint. But today, I'm gonna have, I need a little bit more um, substance in the medium, and I'm using cold press linseed oil with a little bit of, um, of turpentine. And that is, that is about uh, less than one to one. Just put a little bit less than, than the same amount you put of oil. I really don't measure exactly. I just know that, you know, if I put one amount of linseed oil, I put a little bit less of that same amount of turpentine into it, okay? And uh, you have noticed that I have a palette that I hold. I'd rather have a palette to carry with me because I've tried painting from a table and it feels detached to me when I go reach to get the colors. And this way, I can have my colors with me. I can look at them in different lighting conditions just by moving around and shifting it. And plus, I feel more connected to it when I'm grabbing it and putting it on my, on my, on my canvas. And plus, it looks sexy. So let's uh, get to painting. Uh, this is gonna be the first painting stage. Okay, so the first thing we do now, we have set the model. I'm looking at the, my painting. My paint uh, is totally dry. 
So that's good. After a day of work, um, everything is perfectly a uh, good base to be uh, painted upon. That's what you want. You don't want to be painting on wet paint. It becomes very uncomfortable and it mixes with the under layers. So make sure uh, for this type of system that the layer underneath is totally dry, you know, uh, before you, uh, you go and add some paint on top. The first thing I do, and I take advantage of this as much as I can because I have a fresh eye, and I immediately saw a lot of things that need attention because yesterday as I was uh, drawing and then painting, I lost some drawings or, and now I have more reference. Everything is uh, in context. So I can see errors I even did while drawing. I couldn't pick up at that time. So always it's a priority to look at the uh, proportions and go back and go back and keep fixing them because that is what is going to be uh, the most important thing and what is going to be appreciated. If those things are in the right place, uh, you will be able to enjoy the colors and the, and the transitions of, of uh, tones, etc. So looking at her now, see a few things and the, uh, the way I'm going to approach it is that I'm gonna go and fix those things, mark those things, instead of going and saying, okay, let me render and paint, and while I'm there, I fix it up. No, I'm gonna go a little bit bold about it and make some marks on it, kind of drawing again, so that I can have a better experience at uh, my first painting stage. I see that this here can be higher up. I'm gonna exaggerate the, the the height of the shoulder and of course with that comes adjusting the height of the of the edge, the boundary here of the blouse, so bringing that up. And that will give me a better gesture because if, if this is too much the same level, it's kind of boring. You want to make a little bit of a twist, uh, a symmetry there, so it becomes more interesting. The play with painting is that you have to uh, make kind of like a, a game between, between uh, unity and um, and balance and uh, anomaly, bringing things that contrast each other and at the same time putting things that work good together. And in between those two things is what gives movement and interest to the work. And I kind of can go, come back and, and perfect it later, but for now I just want it, before I forget, if I see it, I just mark it. So that's about the height, I want to have that. Also, here, uh, this is going to be the height, and here I feel that I can have my neck inside a little bit more to have uh, more gesture also with the curvature of her pose, of her you know, uh, gaze. It's going to have a better strength if, if I make that curve a little bit more. So I'm going to make a little bit of background color, which is just black and a little bit of white, and I'm going to increase the gesture there. Now, of course, this distance, because of that movement um, of shape. Don't worry if this looks like uneven. I'm going to paint all over the whole thing again. So I'm just correcting shapes. And, 
and then I'm going to move the blouse inside just a little bit more. Okay, so we have kind of uh, attended to those differences there. I also see, and I get a smaller brush for this because this is a smaller change, the ears. Now aligning, aligning them and seeing them a little bit more, I can raise them up a tiny bit. Um, raise that one up a little bit and this one here and remember every every time you see something that needs change if you fix it up uh, that causes something else to shift because everything was kind of working together as it was so if you want to improve upon it and I do that now the ear has become shorter from the bottom but then it's shorter so you make sure you add to the top of it so everything you move at this point will have a, an effect on the things around it. but that's fine And then I realize also that the, the jaw can go down a bit more. So I'm going to have the bottom of the head move down a little bit. So pretty much I'm drawing with paint. That's why you shouldn't detach drawing from painting as much because it, it really, it's independent from the materials you're using. You're just drawing, it's the attitude of, uh, of uh, delineation and representation of things. Okay, so now I know that that's going to be the bottom of my head there. I'm going to do this. The mouth, I want to move a little bit that way. Now, if this will be the center of the head, going like that, I feel that this section of the mouth should be shorter than this just because of perspective. Uh, it's going backwards. And now I'm looking that I see that this part here is kind of longer than this. So I just want to move uh, my mouth, in, I mean her mouth, inside a little bit. OK. 
Okay. So that we took away from that. Let's add a little bit more to this side. And that also changed how the center was. So we have to move that center a little bit more towards the left. So basically, with first painting, you want to get more of the resemblance of the sitter. And, and after you get that, you add more information to it. It's building up on top of what you did yesterday. And if you see things that have changed in her that you kind of want to incorporate, that you liked it better design-wise than, yes, than uh, the previous day, Add it, you know, just change it up. I, I think I did a little bit too much, so. Keep those edges of the lips soft. It'll make a very strong division there. So we have to keep looking around and seeing how, what else can we fix. We have raised this, we looked around here, and of course, this is not the, I'm just fixing shapes now. I'm not going to, um, that's just a little bit before my, my attitude with, uh, with first painting. Just before first painting, I'm just correcting um, colors, I mean, correcting shapes and adding a little bit more color because now my palette is full. Um, but just before that, I have to keep forcing myself and see how I can fix stuff. I see s some little things in the nose that I missed yesterday. Um, the shadow design here is better if I... Look at it closer. See the nose a little bit thicker than what I had, so let me just add a little bit to it. Under the nose there, we see a lot of um, chromatic uh, chroma there, so make sure you don't become timid about it. If you see places, small places with high chroma, 
put them because those accents are going to give life um, to the painting. The whole face will be a play of high chroma versus uh, low chroma and sharpness versus softness. So the edges, some edges you want to crisp up a little bit, some edges you want it to be kind of lost, some colors you want to be gray, some colors you want to be up. You don't want to be in between those things where all the edges are kind of the same and all the colors are kind of the same because you're going to lack uh, that power, the punch. The nostrils is a good place to put some chroma, really dark, but they're really um, warm inside. And the reason I think it's good to divide these stages is that yesterday we were in a little bit bolder about it. We were in, um, kind of like at it. We wanted to, we had the drawing down, so we were confident about that. And we wanted to fill, up, fill in the space kind of as quickly as possible, of course, not as, you know, but as quick because you just wanted to see everything in context and not be uh, influenced by the color of the canvas. But today is a different day, and it's better if we approach this with more attention, a little bit more carefulness, um, and not so like crazy like we were yesterday. Um, so make sure there's time for everything. And first painting is the time to be precise, and tomorrow is going to be more precise. So that's how we um, divide our, our stages. Okay, I'm happy with the shapes now for the nose. Let's look around, what else? Okay, I see the eyes. Um, I was looking at it earlier. Can be higher up a little bit. Because I'm looking at the distance between the eyebrows and here, and I see a lot, a lot of distance here. So maybe this can go, come down. Uh, a little bit more of the hairline come, come down. But I think in proportion to this, the eyebrows are pretty in a good location here. And this distance between the top of the eye and the eyebrow, the eyelid there, see it a little bit too wide. So I, uh, when I see a problem like that, I kind of analyze it first and not go at it and say, oh yeah, more, uh, you know, it's bigger and go and make it smaller. No, it's better to analyze what is going to be of most importance. So first, I'm going to lower the hairline there. Of course, you first fix the shape, then attend to the to the edges.
If you have a, a hard edge, that increases the optical illusion of contrast. So it, it, it looks like more contrast if you have a division between two values that, I, uh, that is divided by a harder edge. So uh, if there are two ways to decrease that contrast. Is, uh, one of them is by softening the edge, and the other thing is by getting the values closer together. So you can play with that idea of having either uh, getting the va values closer together will decrease the contrast, or um, having the edge in the middle uh, softer. So the same way you can see it uh, the opposite way. You can see two areas and, and say they look, um, if you want to increase the contrast, you can just sharpen the edge and that would increase it, make the values look uh, a little bit more exaggerated. The lighter will look lighter, the light will lo uh, look lighter, and the dark will seem darker just because that edge is sharp. And if you see, I'm getting little, very little medium for this. I haven't even, uh, I think it's the first time I kind of dip it in, in the oil. Uh, I don't need it yet. You only use the medium if you really need it. If you feel that something is uncomfortable about painting, you need it to be a little bit more, um, to run a little bit better, then you add it. But it's better if you stay away from mediums. that eyebrow there was a little bit too high up so let me bring it down a little bit Again, we see some variations there, but we don't want to get too caught up in doing little things like that yet. It's better to improve upon the bigger problems. I think, I think we can raise this up a little bit. Um, might look weird at first because you, see, when you're changing the drawing, things look strange because they used to work together like that. But so you have to give it a second, work it around, and kind of fix it up. So don't judge me too soon. <laughs> what are you doing, Caesar?
area in the eyes is really warm. So I'm just fixing it with the closest color to to the to the area I'm working on. So uh, even though you're thinking of um, shapes, you still want to get something closer. So it's not so um, you know d uh, different from what you need. Okay, so now I raise that eye up a little bit. I need to raise the other one. And don't forget the eyelids. The lower eyelid is always visible. Um, make sure it's visible where it is. And all the secrets, really, to painting is in front of you. There is nothing, you know, how do you paint an eye? Well, look at the eye and study it and see the forms and the, and the colors and the shift of, um, of hues and try to describe it. I know it's, it's a little, you know, it's difficult, but, uh, but it's not a trick. It's not, you know, some, a lot, I used to think uh, before going to the, to the Angel Academy that they're going to show me this magic trick how to make eyes and flesh and stuff. But it's not like that. It's really, uh, it's all based on principles. But all the secrets are really in front of you. Just pay attention to the model, and that's it. I'm not, I just uh, want to put a little highlight there because I see it, but also it serves me to, to look at the values and the distance. Um, So I raised up the whole eye. If you saw, I started from the from the um, lowering a little bit, fixing up the eyebrow. If I see a problem with the eye, and sometimes most of the time we have problems around that area because it's something people look at. When you look at someone, you look at the straight in the eyes. So in paintings, it's a difficult area because it's the more uh, the, uh, the most judge area. So if I realized that there was something wrong with the eye that I had there. Um, before going for it, and I explained it before, but let me say it again in a different way. Before going for it, it's better to fix around it, you know. Uh, looked at the mouth, looked at the nose, then fixed uh, the forehead a little bit, then the eyebrow. So you kind of like go around and get closer to the problem, but if you go try fixing it from the beginning, you might make uh, wrong decisions because you don't know that it was something else making it look bad. So first you want to go around it, then you say, okay, now I can fix it. And that's the most uh, effective way to, to approach it, I think. Oh, 
Okay, so now um, the other eye. Let's go here, make sure. And one of the reasons to have the premix colors is that I don't have to be thinking too much when I am mixing now to fix that thing. Imagine, I'm already concerned about those problems of drawing problems and values and colors. Imagine if now after that I go and look at my palette and I have to make that color from scratch. I'm uh, just doing more, more problem for me to, to be dealing with. So it's better if I just kind of solve one problem, I have it in control, I have my, my um, instrument tuned to what I'm going to be working with, so then I can just focus in this, and that way we have a more um, you know, ple ple pleasant experience. So imagine if yesterday we did, we put more details on all this stuff. It would have been either too uh, depressing to change it now, because you kind of realize that you have to, you wasted your time, or you, you know, you just don't want to do it because you kind of did it yesterday. So that's why it's better to be simple at first, because if you have to change something, you don't regret um, working on it you know, too much in the first, the first time you did it. So it's better to be simple at first. So when you change things, it's easier on you. So now I'm not feeling bad for kind of moving this stuff around.
These little intricate shapes require a lot of attention and uh, and time, really. You you, um, you cannot afford to be simple and quick about it. You have to be, really study how everything moves around. And if it takes you longer, just, you know, it's worth it because it's that's the expression of the sitter. And after a while, if you see that something is not working, you still, still don't find what it is, just take a break and look around and say, okay, maybe I can bring this up a little bit. And attend to other areas. Uh, maybe you come back to it and see it. And at that scale, it's so small that with this brush you can easily make a, make a mistake and move it around. There. But you don't want to get something smaller because that's minute. The, big, uh, the bigger the change, um, the better at first. You just want to make sure everything's working out without having to go into smaller areas. Then we might get a smaller brush. But for now, they have to work um, just with this size brush. Okay, so after I kind of, I'm pretty happy with the quick uh, drawings that I changed around here, but even to be more sure that those things are working, I'm gonna think now more of color and I'm gonna add uh, more precise values and colors to this, to the eyes just to make sure. They're fine. The top part of the eyelid, it's, um, it's darker because it's casting that shadow from the upper eyelid. And the bottom part has more chroma in it because light is bouncing off the bottom there.
And in first painting, all you need is a simple impression with the correct value, shape, and color, but not so much rendering. So tomorrow I'm gonna be more precise about that, but for now, I'm gonna do it in a more simple way. You can see the warmth inside those folds on the eyelids there. And the same thing that happened to that, the white of the eye has to be darker on top and grayer because it's casting that shadow from the upper eyelid. And towards the center, it becomes a little bit of more higher chroma. And then we get the highlight and incorporate it there to make sure that it's looking okay. And then one here. Okay, so we go back and I see that this is a little darker here, so I go ahead and put it as the eyebrow in shadow there under the, the bone of the eye socket there, so it's kind of curving in and get, casting a shadow. And the eyebrows are, should stay soft, because that's just kind of hair going around from the inside of the of the eye sockets there in the bone, it goes and goes upwards. So we go back to this eye, making sure also 
that have better color. I mean, a couple of touches of higher chroma in the bottom there because light is reaching that area more than the upper part. So up here is darker and down here is just lighter, more chromatic. And all I'm, set, I'm, all I'm doing here is setting myself up for a better experience of painting tomorrow. That's why it's indirect approach. Um, it's blocky, you can see, it's just trying to achieve the right impression. But really, we're gonna take that, uh, those nuances tomorrow to the next level when we paint more uh, for the, to describe the, the texture. And to take that realism to, to the high level. Anybody can start a painting. The problem is to finish it with, uh, with detail and not lose the broadness of it. That's why I think you should um, practice taking pa paintings to a high level of finish, um, even if it's not your, it's not what you want in life. Even Sargent, uh, in his early paintings, started with more attention and more precision, and that gave him the ability that, when he was more mature, decided to be more bold about it, and and you see that the the beauty of his brushstrokes is that control that he has. Uh, it's not clumsiness or being aggressive or crazy about it. It's actually uh, done with a lot of precision. I wanted to mention that the professional artist is always a student, but as a, as a more mature artist, you're not only a student. So you study things with a purpose rather than when you're just going to school, you're absorbing everything and everything is being taught to you. It's important and it's new. 
So, and after school, when you become, you keep being a student, you never stop learning, right? But the, the studies change direction. Now you do study on purpose for a specific um, thing that you want to learn instead of learning whatever is being pres uh, presented to you. In this case, uh, when I, I have reference, yesterday um, I showed things that you can have around you that might be helpful. For instance, the, um, the head with planes or the skull in the same position as the model. Uh, the photography, a photo of a model in that same position so you can compare how the camera interpreted that uh, field in front of it. And, um, and of course, it doesn't, the photo doesn't show the volume as well as you can do because you can conceptualize it to make it look more real, more um, three-dimensional. So in preparation for this portrait, I did a study of uh, a copy of a Bugaro uh, specifically to learn the value range within the head, the face. And if you can see, when we look at this uh, portrait, we see the lights have higher chroma, and as they turn towards the shadow, they become cooler, and then the shadow is warm. So I just wanted to study that specifically, how that movement of, of hue and value uh, happen in, in that in that particular portrait so that I can apply it to my, to my model here. I think it's important to do a lot of copies. That's why it's, it's a must that you have a sketchbook and do these type of things. Well, I mean, you can do it without a sketchbook too, but copying masterworks is a must if you wanna get good because this will be the, the bridge between the paintings in the museum and your own work and your studio. The, if I take my sketchbook around and I go up to the real painting in the museum and compare it, and it's pretty good, then I can just uh, compare it in my studio to my, my painting, and I can relate then my painting to the master paintings at uh, the museum. So that's why it's, uh, it's kind of like a bridge, a communication between uh, these uh, works from the past. So in this case, if you see out of, in context, these colors, compared to the white here, are very dark. Uh, the hair is really dark, and that's making our lights look lighter. But if you look isolate, isolated here, this is all the colors I'm using for my portrait here. This here is the lightest value, and that's the general color for all this lights area. And you can see compared to the white of the paper, it's pretty dark. If you don't control this, uh, when you're mixing the paint in your palette, it might look too dark to you and you say, no, no, that's way too dark. It's not looking realistically, um, you know, it's not looking correct, so let me just light it up. And I see a lot of portraits having that problem. You keep adding light to it because we are used to looking at screens and, and a lot of light and the, the, the pictures come out too bleached out and we forget to have the correct value to it. So uh, I just, I'm just showing you this because for me it was an interesting discovery that these colors are very dark compared to the white but as soon as you have them in the face, in context, they look okay. And I have to be aware of that, so when I'm painting here and mixing my colors on my palette, I, am, uh, I know that that's okay. I kind of trust it because it did work here. But it requires a lot of study in the museums. Okay, so let's get back to painting. Okay, so now we are ready to continue first painting. We did some uh, adjustments. We just finished looking around and fixing major things that needed to be attended to uh, fix before we continue. But now our goal is to kind of, in a blocky way, um, put, put the right color in the right place. And the same thing we did yesterday, I start with the darks. Because um, the canvas was uh, pretty light, so if I add, if I keep it like this, it's probably gonna influence the way I judge my light. So I want to make sure those darks are the right value now before I continue to my lights. So now I'm gonna go and work on the darks first, my darkest darks. And if you can see uh, the model, 
the darkest areas are the shadow of the hair. It's important that when you look at what you're gonna paint your model, you find the lightest place and the darkest place first. So you know that range, that's gonna be your limit. And then you work in between those uh, extreme values. Getting a little bit of the cold press linseed oil. And what I'm putting here is the mixture of ivory black and a touch of Indian red. And you can see how darker it is to compared to what I had. So if I wouldn't have um, done the, the darks first, I probably misjudge the lights. I tend to be thinner in the darks than in the lights. That way, if you need variety, that tendency comes from a necessity. Uh, back in the days, the darks covered pretty much the surface when you painted on. But the lights, we, we didn't have titanium white uh, until recently, 100 and so years ago. But before, they used to have lead white, and that was transparent. So to get the lights, um, to achieve the lights in the light areas, you needed to add a lot of white because that was more transparent. So out of a practical reason, the lights became more within pastels. And then the shadows didn't need to be, uh, didn't need to have as much of a, of a body to them because they can cover uh, pretty good the area. So, but now we realize that it looks good too to have a difference in, uh, in strength and in, in volume. So we kind of do that. Even though with titanium white, you can be pretty thin in the lights and, and achieve the light that you need, but it still looks good to having pastels in the lights and transparencies in the darks. If you notice, I'm grabbing my brush pretty far away from the tip of it. You don't want to draw with it like this. You don't want to do this if you're doing a broad mass. Yes, if you are doing a detail from back here, you have less control. But in this case, it's better to be away from it um, so you can see really where you're pointing. Before we had a general value for the hair, complete uh, mass of the hair, but now we become more specific about the value. So within that darkness, now we're gonna make some variations in the darks. Now is the time to do it. If we, if we would have done it yesterday, right out of, after the drawing, 99% of the time, or 100% of the time, you're gonna have it wrong because it's, it's just impossible to judge.
I'm running out of this uh, mixture here. So let me go and get. If you can see, this is my pre-mix, I call it Dark Shade, and that is this mixture's, uh, mixture between the Ivory Black and Indian Red. And just so you can know um, how I got to that, I get Ivory Black, Indian Red, just a touch. and add it, and it's the same color. It's the same um, color that I mix. The only difference is that I don't want to mix it because I might need these two colors like this soon. So I just rather have my pre-mix here. That way I don't use these two colors because I, might, I wanna use that ivory black for the background and everything. So that's why I just brought, instead of mixing it, um, I got the, the pre-mix to and that way also I'm more uh, constant with the, with the color. And I see now that this is always gonna change in shape, but uh, it, f for the composition, I feel that if this is going around, I'm creating a spiral around hair um, by having the hair piece pointing that way, and then you, that throws your eye to come around the painting, and when you find this place, it directs you to kind of go up again and enjoy her face. So, I decided to do that instead of looking how it is now and having it more pointing down, it would have like an exit point from there. So I, I analyze it, I look at it, and my thinking uh, process is, no, I like it like this because it goes like that. It, it throws me back up with the line of the neck and then again with the hair piece. So these are decisions that you have to make as an artist when you're painting to make it more interesting. That engages the viewer and then they might like your painting more than another one next to it in, the, in an exhibition or something and they don't know why. They say, I don't know why, but I love your portrait, it's alive. And those are little things that you decide that makes it more intriguing and interesting to the, to the eye. As I'm painting the hair, putting more information there, I'm looking at the form of the head, of the hair. Uh, this part is darker because it folds inside. There's a mass of the hair here. So it goes outside then inside. So this is darker where, where it meets uh, the forehead there because it goes around. So make sure that when you're painting that, you don't uh, say his hair, let me make it dark and highlights. Make sure you first understand the form before you decide where to put the lights and the darks. It's always good to not just paint, just to paint. It's better to think about it and then when you put a mark, it becomes more efficient. You know, I haven't, if you have seen me paint, I haven't just gonna go ahead and uh, paint around and hope for it to get good. I just make decisions and go for it. And if it's wrong, I fix it. So it's just a kind of 
problem solving attitude instead of saying, I'm going to be painting today and just going for it. Okay, so now that I have the hair kind of uh, with the right values, deciding more or less on the shapes, I can go ahead and soften the, the edges a little bit. Hair is soft, so it's a good idea to have it um, exaggerate the, the edges. Because remember what I was said yes, uh, before, if you focus in the edge here, the boundary of the head, it looks sharper when you focus. That's, we are made to do that. Just force yourself to exaggerate a little bit so that there is a difference between the edge of the hair and the edge of, for instance, I don't know, the, the flesh here in the bottom. Um, you, wanna, you wanna have that feel different so that there is a bone here doing pressure rather than just soft material uh, against the background. Now we can go to the shadow in the flesh and then we treat the lights afterwards. And I'm changing brushes because I'm changing material. Um, now when I look at my model and I look at this contrast, now I know that my darkest darks was around this hair here and it can even be darker. Tomorrow I can come back when this is dry and add a little bit of uh, more depth to that shadow there. But for now, that's, uh, that's good. And I see m a lot of contrast here. In here, see a little bit less. So I want to see what do I do. I can soften the edge and keep this the same value, or I can darken this a little bit. And I think I can go ahead and get a little bit of my shadow. darken it a little bit more. You don't want to go too dark. bringing some raw umber next to my shadow here. So in case I need to darken it, I just have it here. Now the ear is right next to it. So right now, there's just a flat surface, right? Because it's a canvas. And the ear, since I put this dark here, it's in between the darkest uh, piece here in the hair and my shadow. So how do I make it so that it looks to the viewer as if the ear is back a couple of uh, cent uh, inches back in, in towards the hair there. So that, and also warmer. Normally warm colors tend to come forward and cool recede. So in this case, it's tricky because the ear is warmer, but it has to stay in the back. So how do we do it? We close the values so that it looks um, darker than how we see it. And that way, and by softening the edge, we also make it appear further. Remember, things further from us tend to be softer. If you look at a landscape, things that are close to you, they look more contrasty and sharper. Things in the back, uh, you know, look fuzzy and soft. The same idea here, the same principles. If you want the ear to recede, make sure you do a softer. If you focus, 
on the air in, in nature, it will look sharp because there is a division there. So just uh, make sure you exaggerate it to a good level that it uh, recedes. It's good to have this, um, the right side of the, of the painting dry so you can put your pinky there. If you need control to paint on a small area, you want to have a nice support. I don't like using a uh, mall stick because it's like in the way you have to carry it. So I just put my pinky here and use it as a kind of a support. But I guess you, you know, that's up to you to. Even when it's wet, I put my pinky there and then I just clean it up, but I end up having all these marks. And even in small areas like this, you want to be aware of how the light is affecting it. The top part of the ear is a little darker because it's, um, it's kind of leaning that way, so it's away from the light. And then the bottom part kind of folds upward a little bit, and that's getting more light. So even at that small scale, you want to understand what's happening so that it's uh, believable. A good way to soften an edge, you can do kind of like zigzag it around, so it goes in and out, blending both um, colors. And it's also a good idea to have both colors wet. So when you touch the edge, they kind of merge together. If you have an area that is dry, it's harder to do it because it's kind of glazing. If you pull a, a color into a dry area, it's going to have a different effect because it's gonna spread it thinner, so it becomes warmer or cooler, depending on, depending on the value. But it's a good idea to have both colors um, wet so you can kind of have a better experience softening it. We have to be careful also. For instance, I'm painting this area here, and I even if I put the right, the same color, right? I get the same shadow color, and I put it from here all the way to the edge. The illusion, the it looks like if it was lighter towards the edge, just because it's near um, this dark here, and here. It looks darker because it's close to a light area. So even, for instance, in this area here, the it probably looks like this side is lighter than the inside, but it's not. It's the same color, just going across. It's just an optical illusion. To, to, uh, to solve that, is that if that is uh, kind of bothering you, even though that's the same effect in nature, because we do that, it's more contrasted here, so it looks lighter. And here, it looks uh, darker by contrast. To avoid that, you just get some dark and add it just to the edge here so that it looks like that's going back. It's going back from here and then to, to the edge there.
And before you put any reflected light in the shadow, first have a clean, a clean note, one value, and then add it. Because if you put it from the beginning, it might look like uh, you might exaggerate it. I chose to paint on a smooth canvas because I like uh, to have my brush stroke showing. And uh, the thicker the weave of the canvas, the more exaggerated you have to be to show the brush strokes. So it's up to you the type of canvas that you uh, choose. I've painted in different types. And I find that for portraiture and for fine detail, it's just better to have a smooth canvas, um, smooth uh, surface to work on. But it's not about better or worse, it's just personal choice. It's a good idea if you're working on the darks to squint so you can kind of uh, put those values in the shadow close together, even knowing that they become more contrasted when you focus on them. Uh, even if you have experience, they still trick you. So make sure you use stuff like squinting or the black mirror um, to, to compress um, and group together those darks, uh, uh, dark areas. So now that we have done the hair and the shadow, um, the shadow, the shadow side, we are ready to kind of move towards the light. I'm looking at the range here. Look for some, some of the warmth 
warm touches around the edge between the hair and the and the flesh there's like a warm note around that and look for those and add them there they kind of make it look more alive when you do them I'm gonna change to a bigger, uh, broader brush because I just wanna be more efficient. Adding some cool, getting from gray here, mixing it up. My flesh here, so it just feels cooler. So the forehead is just transitioning towards the dark, losing chroma uh, before it hits a little bit of a shadow here. And the same happens to that area. We are using a type of lighting that is called crest lighting, meaning that the lighting is uh, facing us, is hitting uh, kind of like, not the center, it could be towards the center of the form or towards one side, but there is either uh, rim light, which is the light that comes from the side. Most of the, uh, of the surface will be in shadow, but this is a very, this light is the best light that shows the form because uh, it's just facing you. The light is uh, right in the middle of the form and it's clear uh, how it turns to each side. So for instance, this side of the, of the head is gonna become darker so that we have uh, the illusion that the forehead is coming towards us, turning around. So you can see um, my handling of the paint is just very direct and opaque. I'm just trying to solve that problem of value and color.
And as soon as you kind of um, described uh, the, the surface of an area, make sure you go around the edge and see the quality of the edge. And I see that here I could be softer because right now I have a sharper edge here, which is fine for variation. You want variety in the edges. Here is softer than this part and it comes towards the light. I want to have a little bit of a softer transition to the hair so that I add variety to, to the forehead. And if we do that throughout the painting, then the whole painting becomes much more exciting. Now we see that before all this, the area looked flatter and now we have some volume on it. So let's catch up and try to have it um, throughout the head. As a principle, it's better to have the shadows uh, more similar, meaning having kind of the same color through the shadows and more variety in the lights. That way the painting has this uh, dignity to it. If you add too much difference in the shadows, it loses that strength. So think about the variety in the lights and more constant with the shadow. I talked about a, using a black mirror before and it's very useful because it compresses the the, the darks together and separates them from the lights. And if you have uh, trouble uh, simplifying the shadows, this is the, a good tool because you can look at it and see, uh, compare it to the model and seeing if your families from the darks and the lights are working together. The difference between using um, a black mirror and a regular mirror is that the regular mirror is to compare shapes. You can see it upside down to compare it to the model. Uh, you can, you know, step back away. Some people just put it on the top if you see it like that also upside down. But this black mirror is uh, useful just for the values, um, not so much for the shapes because it's dark. Don't use your phone. I see a lot of people getting um, an iPhone or something when it's off and they kind of use it as a black mirror. That's not a good idea because this, it's um, a deeper dark. Uh, actually, the phones do the opposite. When you look at it through the screen of the iPhones or any, any phone, any smartphone, what happens is that the darks look lighter and the lights look darker. You don't want that. The effect of the black mirror is for the darks to look darker and compress. And yes, the lights are going to look darker, but not so much. They're going to separate these two families. So it's very useful. Um, I don't want to get too crazy about judging what I just did here, because the purpose of this is a, is a better setup for tomorrow. Um, what we did yesterday was a good foundation to do this, but now it's fine. Tomorrow we're going to come and describe the texture and fine tune it and that's enough information there to do it. If uh, by the end of the day today I cover everything and I want to fix some stuff, I can do it, but not 
take it to a finish. It's just with the intention of having a better reference for tomorrow. But that's fine, just let's uh, keep moving down. And it's better if we finish an area here to not go and jump to you know the shin or the neck or something like that. It's better to go um, uh, to organize it so that you go uh, one thing after the other. That way you can judge it better. The forehead turns in um, here at the bridge of the nose, so we have we darken this to make the illusion that it's going in like that. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com.
www.thepatriotmedia.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Streamline Art Video is proud to partner with Art Renewal Center to bring you Secrets of Portrait Painting with ARC Master Artist and Salon winner, Cesar Santos. In his early childhood in Cuba, Cesar, always interested in creative arts, built mud sculptures in the rain and used his imagination to invent toys. At the age of 12, after emigrating with his family to Miami, he dreamt of a future as an artist, even while participating in the sport of boxing and attending a magnet school for architecture. His first love was always fine art. After learning a contemporary view of post-impressionistic principles, Cesar wanted to add to his knowledge by understanding the scientific aspect of painting. He set off to the Angel Academy in Florence and then took that knowledge to meld what is now his unique and personal style, reflecting both modernism and traditionalism. Cesar is well known for creating portraits that reflect his passion for the unnoticeable yet irreplaceable people of his community. In this extended video, follow along with Cesar as he expertly guides you through each step of preparing, creating, and finishing a portrait painting. With his systematic approach, Cesar removes the difficulties many artists encounter when painting portraits. He'll show you proven techniques that he has developed through many years of his studies. It's always good to find out what the problem is. Sometimes we see problems and in our lives we do that a lot. That's a problem. That's bad. That's easier than finding how to fix the problem. So as soon as you find the solution, that is what matters. Whether you favor classical or contemporary, you will benefit from all Cesar offers in this video, where nearly every brushstroke is captured for you to see. Cesar is very comfortable working in front of the camera, and you'll find his playful yet serious style easy to learn from. His principle-based teaching methods are straightforward and practical taking portrait painting, something that many artists find difficult, and making it much easier to learn and apply. All of this has the, the teeth inside the structure of bones. It's just a circular uh, shape that goes from side to side here, like that, and then from uh, top to bottom going like that too. Cesar breaks down the process for you into four stages, drawing and constructing, dead coloring, first painting, and second painting. Anybody can start a painting. The problem is to finish it with, uh, with detail and not lose the broadness of it. In each stage, Cesar will not only demonstrate what he routinely does in his own work, he'll carefully explain in detail why he does it this way and the advantages these methods have. So in this case, I put the white, light red, and a little bit of yellow. Mix it up to a nice flesh. I see, I see a lot of paintings having this line too thin at the end. Remember, that's something that is folding inward like that. So it has to have an area of darkness that is just, you know, before it goes totally inside the mouth. So make sure Make sure that this has some uh, width and height to it. You can then take this information and incorporate it into your own paintings in no time. Soon you'll be enjoying painting portraits more than ever. Watch as he skillfully paints a realistic portrait from start to finish, interpreting physical features and developing flesh tones with great precision. Because of Cesar's unique teachable talent, this video is appropriate and useful for all skill levels. The whole experience of just one painting is uh, really interesting and it, it looks for emotions within the artist. And now is the time to be precise and kind of like meditate into, into the, this world that you have created here. 
And that's the beauty of, of being an artist. The skills Cesar teaches are unique, yet universal and you'll find his techniques to be a natural way of building and creating portrait painting that you will be proud to show off. In this video, you'll also enjoy a showcase of Cesar's artwork, along with an interview of the artist conducted by Vern G. Swanson, Art Renewal Center trustee. Also featured is a musical composition directly inspired by the artist work from Brazilian composer Giacomo Lombardi. This video will become a treasure in your own resource library and you'll want to refer to it over and over as you master Cesar's secrets of portrait painting. Secrets of Portrait Painting is the biggest selling art instruction video in history, anywhere. It's huge. It's a must. Anyway, if you want to learn more about it, you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's talk to the artist himself and do an interview. Hello, my name is Vern Swanson, uh, Director Emeritus of the Springville Museum of Art in Springville, Utah. Uh, it's my pleasure today to be with uh, Cesar Santos, uh, outstanding young artist out of Miami and uh, Cuba. And we'll be talking with him about his life and his art and, and the art world of, of today. And it's really exciting because uh, he's a very well-connected artist who knows many people, more importantly, everybody knows him. And so let's begin. Hello, Caesar. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here, Vern. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. It's great to talk to you. Uh, it's, it's been um, uh, wonderful to spend the last uh, day uh, getting to know you better. Um, uh, a lot of people would like to know, uh, who is the real Caesar Santos? Tell us about how you began your life and, and, and how you got to where you are today. Well, I was born in Cuba in uh, Santa Clara. It's a small city, uh, town in, in Cuba. And there I grew up pretty much wild. Uh, we had uh, little uh, toys to play with, so we had to invent our own toys. And I think at, at an early age, that got me to be a little bit uh, of a craftsman. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, also getting creative with, uh, with having not so much things to do. Getting creative when it was raining, go out and do sculptures in the mud or, or doing our own, you know, um, conversational uh, pieces with friends in the, when their lights went off and stuff like that. Because uh, I grew up in a moment uh, that Cuba was having uh, some serious trouble after separating from Russia. And anyway, so I, in two th when I was 12 in um, 1995, my family immigrated to America, to Miami. And that's when my whole life kind of changed completely because <laughs> now I had a future ahead of me and I had things to engage in uh, more seriously. And that's when I started uh, more interested in the arts. Before it was my uncle in Cuba influencing me, saying, you have talent, go draw, do these uh, drawing exercises. Ah. But it wasn't a serious thing because I was boxing as well. My father put me into several sports, uh, track and field <laughs> and boxing. And even though I kept practicing them and still do, um, my focus in America was to become a fine artist, a painter. Oh my goodness. So when did you decide that you would be maybe an artist? I decided when I was in middle school and ah. the only good uh, grades I had was in arts art <laughs> class. My art teacher said, you cannot go to a public uh, school, apply if you don't have money for a private school, just apply to a magnet school. And we have one of the best in the nation, design and architecture, senior high. Mm. And that, I think, was when I decided to launch my career in the design field, in the art um, uh, field with uh, design and architecture. Ah. And then from there, I decided that I wasn't going to be an architect. So I turned into fine arts. Um, so for college. So I just kept going 
uh, more and more into painting. And more into painting. And what kind of painting? You went to art school, um, the New World um, uh, school, school of the Arts. Of the Arts. For college, um, yeah. And um, uh, what kind of school was that? And what kind of uh, art were you um, um, uh, basically directed towards? Well, I was part of the art establishment. So pretty much that school was uh, based on the contemporary views after post-impressionist type of principles, mm -hmm. um, more uh, directed to conceptual art and experimentation rather than developing the classical techniques or the craftsmanship um, to, to see the world around us and represent it. It was not about that. It was more how to live as an artist, how to see as an artist um, in terms of what we call artists yeah. nowadays. Uh, nowadays. Uh, now, uh, so basically it was a modernist, postmodernist uh, type of uh, art education. Uh, but that's not exactly where you are today. Um, uh, what, there was, must have been a turnaround somewhere. Uh, how did your life change that in such a way that you are now the artist we know you are? Well, I see myself as being part of that and I would like to be always uh, I never thought of myself as a classical or a purist painter. The only difference is that I was not happy with the teachings uh, um, I was getting in the school because it was one direction oriented. It was mm -hmm. only conceptual and, and experimentation and never uh, the scientific part of painting, which I loved. Um, right. I looked at our history books and I looked at Velasquez and I say, how did he do that? And page by page, different names come up and all these secrets <laughs> were lost. So I think uh, as, a, um, as an artist, developing artist, I saw myself that, uh, with the responsibility to go and learn how to do that if that was my passion. Mm -hmm. But I, do, I didn't want to escape the contemporary art world. Yeah. I wanted to be part of it because that's, when I, that's how I started to, wanting to be part of it. I just wanted to add something new to it. Uh, so basically, uh, you were that and now you're going to be this. You're going to meld the two together. Um, yeah, so I well, left how, the school. How, how, so so where, where, how did you do this? What mechanism uh, brought the two together? Well, after four years there, I was about to graduate with a bachelor's degree, and all my future looked like was teaching, like teaching. one of my teachers, uh, yeah. theory of art, <laughs> art history. Uh, yeah. So I, I said, no, I cannot do that. I'm not going to depend on that uh, for my life. So I looked around, and I saw this um, small academy in Florence, the Angel Academy of Art, and I saw the student work on the website and I said, am I that bad as an artist? Are they learning how to do this? Or what is this? So I kept insisting uh, and my parents finally, after a year of me uh, bothering them to um, get me there, they finally um, cooperated and gave me the <laughs> funds to go study there. <laughs> oh my goodness, that, that's uh, spectacular. So how long were you in Italy? Uh, I, at spent, the front, I graduated. Uh, I graduated uh, from the Angel Academy in a year and a half. I was in Florence about two years. About, about two years. And, um, um, and so you kind of set your own agenda. And really it's remarkable. I, I know of no other uh, American artist or European artist who have, has uh, tried to uh, uh, meld the two uh, modernism uh, with, um, 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 uh, with traditionalism. Um, now, uh, tell me, uh, um, which artist, living or dead, um, uh, have been influential in your art career? Well, thank you for uh, mentioning that. Uh, um, just a little bit before that, I wanted to mention that that was my life. After studying uh, in contemporary um, art, academy, um, art school uh, and going through the conceptual training and mixing that with the traditional um, school in Italy, I, I was part of these two worlds and I also saw nobody doing this conversation. Right, so yeah. my series of syncretism was about that, about opening a space within a canvas that both um, faith, bo both uh, opposite schools of thought can live together and interact with each other because that, that was my life, that reflected who I was at the moment. Now about the artists uh, that influenced me, I have never been a type of uh, I don't follow the artists. I look at images uh, of the past, the present, that talk to me, that tell me something that I learn from, and that's what I take away. I don't, uh, there are Rembrandt pieces that I don't really like, and there are you know, uh, unknown painters that I'm blown away by some of their works. 
So, uh, but I have two influences. One is from artists who change the term beauty, that challenge what beauty meant, because we think it's a universal, beauty is universal, but it's not. We know that what is beautiful uh, as makeup in some tribes, we find them horrible. And so <laughs> beauty always changing within the social group that we are. And I think the, the artists like, for instance, Michelangelo, when he did the wall, not the ceiling. You see, the ceiling is, is good taste, it's more organized. And you see the wall and you see the artist saying something different. And that yeah. caused controversy and, and, pro and you know, problem at that time. So I like that. And also Jericho with the Wrath of the Medusa oh. uh, saying, I'm going to... I'm gonna render this huge painting and I'm gonna dedicate it to this uh, problem that we're facing. Or Rembrandt, apl applying texture in that way in a canvas. So I always uh, look for people who are challenging what beauty is. If it's not the beach scene or the flowers of the yeah. beautiful woman. Yeah. And, 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 and for, but on the other hand, there's Bugaro. And I'm a, I copy him more than any other artist because <laughs> he took beauty to that perfect level that is impossible to achieve nowadays, I believe. When I stand in front of the Nymph and Satyr, I don't, like, you know, it doesn't look like a human did that. So for me, that, those are influential um, painters or, or art. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, tell me, so um, you're approaching art Basically different than other um, artists who, who uh, graduated from Angel Academy, which is one of the um, um, uh, more famous um, um, ateliers or academies uh, that are um, a kind of opposing the hegemony, the dominance of, um, uh, of the art world being controlled by uh, postmodernism. So official art of the world today is postmodernism. Modernism, postmodernism. Um, now, uh, there's a, a growing number of academies, like Angel Academy, throughout the world. Now, it's, it's a young movement, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, uh, growing pains. But tell me, what do you think are the strengths and um, the advantage of these new academies, and maybe disadvantages? I mean, because they're not all doing everything right. Uh, they're in their infancy. Well, I think the strength yeah. is that it's an alternative. For me, it was, it was uh, an amazing opportunity to, to be able to go there and know that you can learn this, these principles and, you, and the technique has not completely been lost. Uh, but, uh, so we see the, the positive. Uh, you can actually become more knowledgeable about the world that surrounds you, about the visual uh, effect. You can learn how to mix paint and translate uh, the world around you into a flat surface and make it look three-dimensional. So all these are, are good attributes of those academies. I think the moment you, you go through the training and you become, you acquire this technique and this ability to paint realistically, the so society tell us that this is amazing, it's looking good. Facebook tells you that, your parents tell you that. So you rely on that and think that that is the end and you, and you don't question um, anymore. You say, this is beauty, contemporary artists don't know how to paint, uh, they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about, this is true art because it has been proven in the past. And there is no point to be mimicking classical uh, painting, the, uh, and that's what I see a lot. I see a lot of mimicking and wanting to, but this, but really, it's not about that. I think art has to challenge, take uh, people to a new yeah. place they've never been before. Yeah. It sounds like there's a bit of arrogance there. Once they've attained a minimum degree of proficiency, they think they've gained it all. But it's really uh, student practice. Exactly. That's how be, that has been my challenge mm -hmm. because I want to learn how to be a better painter. I want to create a, with my brush things that will take people's mind mm -hmm. to a new place, a different place. But I want to be uh, I want to be um, relevant to my surroundings. Exactly. I want to say I want to present images that that people that not the public because that's what television does. And I think that's a mix. Um, that's a confusion that we have. I don't care in my art to please people. That should be, as an artist, I want to challenge myself 
and look for what I believe is beautiful or what I believe I should be saying and mm -hmm. saying it. If people like it or not, it's not up to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, normally uh, that that's up to the talented amateur to do that, to, to try to be nice and paint things that people like. But we have television for that. You see beautiful woman, actually influence, the influence from classical painting, you see it in posters from movies, you see it in television all the time, the drapery. The So I think our role nowadays um, is to uh, see how we, we explore our world visually. Uh, yes, now uh, in, in, in today's contemporary um, a modernist um, a do, a dominant um, a world, um, it seems that uh, the artist is um, uh, painting for the cultural elite, for the people who get it. Um, but it's very obscure to the average person. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it sounds like you don't want to go that way and you don't want to go like an illustrator to where you're just painting uh, or, or drawing for um, uh, that's uh, 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 works that everybody gets. It sounds like you're you you want to paint paintings that uh, um, uh, are relevant to you, and you're hoping that they're relevant to other people. But they're yeah. challenging. You you still want to uh, uh, remain a challenger to to people. Yeah, all the time, and to myself. I don't, yeah, I don't sleep in peace. I'm always thinking, what's going to be my next painting? How can I, how can I say something more complete uh, as an expression? Right. And that's why I want to make sure that people understand that these academies are doing an amazing thing because they're giving uh, artists tools to work with. Right. Uh, other than saying, well, you can do everything except knowing how to paint, which is what the only option that the, <laughs> the, the universities are doing. Yes. You can do everything except make a good painting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is uh, not an option at all. You want to have the freedom to add uh, good quality work and contemporary work as well. Mm -hmm. and, and see the beauty that we live in, because it's easy to say, oh, we live in this bad world and this and before it was, and I idealize that, but no. come on, you know, in reality, we are in an amazing place and we can use technology to our advantage. And also, this academy sometimes become too purist and they deprive the students from trying uh, technology and the use of photography or lighting or um, things that in the past has been proven to work. Tempera was the norm. They brought oils. Some painter said, I don't want to paint in oils. I want to paint in tempera. That's the, the tradition. That's yeah, easy. Yeah. You can just blend forever yeah. there. And the same thing with anatomy. Botticelli said, no, conceptualize the figure. What are you doing? And Da Vinci said, no, I'm going to study anatomy and make it more realistic. So there's always been that, that um, challenge in, in um, avant-garde mentalities versus traditional mentalities and what I'm proposing is and what I do is that I see my surroundings I take all the tools I can to just express myself in a complete you, know. you marry them together yeah uh, well traditionally um, it's always been the young artist who's pushed the envelope ah you're a young artist you're uh, <laughs> 33 years I'm getting old. there I'm getting young. Uh, you think <laughs> You think that's old, but it's not. <laughs> I look at that uh, uh, and think it's funny. But anyway, uh, John Ruskin, uh, the uh, uh, art critic of, of, uh, the of Britain in the 19th century, said that all truly great works of art was about something beyond itself. What message or meaning do you have um, uh, beyond your obvious subject? Yeah. Well, I try to do what, what film, movies, and photography ha ha cannot do, and that is to make you see through uh, the work of art, to make you dream into it uh, for a longer period, and see it always differently. And that is something that I don't get with a movie. It just stays in the surface, it's done, I don't want to see it again. And, and a, a painting, for me, when I create art, I try to do it um, so that that powers transcends and when people see my subjects, they, they see beyond the subjects or the activity they're engaging. That's why normally my latest paintings, they're not doing any activity. They're just standing there looking at you. And um, me, by being minimalistic about that expression, I think and painting, the paint quality has to be strong enough to engage you as a viewer and see your whole culture, your community, your, 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 um, your race, you know, or whatever it is that takes you uh, and reflects on your own self. That's why my subjects are facing you, 
and they're just being there for you to, to, to interact with them. Uh, so I hope that it that comes across. Do you want to be famous <laughs> in art history or in popular culture? I would love to be famous in art history. My uncle always told me, you need to take people to a new place. You need to contribute to the art world um, and look for ways that, that takes you there. Like, make a, an effort to, to look at, at things differently. Don't settle for just repeating or trying to mimic the past. And I think that's important. And uh, tell me about your uh, studio practice. Uh, are you a, uh, uh, what we call a studio rat? Or, uh, uh, you know, in the studio, great discipline? Or do you like to um, 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 think more about it and then paint less? I'm more of a studio bat or something, you know? I'm like crazy. <laughs> I go in my studio and just paint all night. <laughs> and, a studio uh, bat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't like the rat part, but yeah. Yes, that's No, but, but I think uh, I have a great work ethic. I, yeah. since because of my background and my, my lack of, of uh, money, and funds, I think I, I had to strive for a successful career in the arts. So I, that made me, and also being an artist is like this, it's challenging yourself. And I work more than any artist I know. Uh, I spend 10 to 14 hours a day, always think of new things, always making a, a painting. If I'm not drawing, I'm writing. If I'm not writing, I'm painting. So that is my life pretty much. And I exercise every day because that's for me is a reset. If mm -hmm. I work eight hours and go to the gym, when I come back after two hours, I'm new again to uh, work some more. To, to work some more. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, now, t tell us a little bit about your procedure um, uh, with painting. Uh, you get up in the morning, you've been thinking, um, um, uh, and I, I saw your sketchbook. And uh, that's very important. But tell us about your sketchbook as, a, as a, uh, a part of that package that make you you. Yeah, I, th I think it's sad that a lot of artists don't have sketchbooks. Uh, for me, it was surprising when I went to the Angel Academy because at the university, the New World School of the Arts College, everybody had to have an, a, an, a sketchbook. And suddenly I find myself in a classroom learning techniques and always people left it to the school. So I think the sketchbook ha has to be there because those are your moments, your thinking process, your practice, and you need that as a warm up, as a brainstorming uh, place. And that is all your intimate thoughts go into your sketchbook. So I think you have to have it uh, if, you're, if you are a serious painter, uh, unless you have just lost, uh, lose, pages full of sketches, which is the same idea, but it's better to have something with you that you can take around. My process in painting, even though I use technology, I think it's very classical in, in, in approach because I take photos and those photos, I, I uh, take them as studies. They're That's not, right. I don't copy the photo because I don't have anything else to paint. It's more that reference. Instead of doing a color study for this and a sketch for that, I get some photos and I arrange them in Photoshop, which is more of a, another study. Yeah, yeah. And all that works to my advantage because it's just faster. And at the end, when I'm painting, I'm looking at all these studies, even though I'm in my studio and not painting from life, I am painting from life because I took the photos from life. My thoughts came from my life. And I think that's a misunderstanding also from the conservative point of view or the purist that painting from life is sitting there and painting in front of the subject. And I think if you don't have arbitrary lighting, if you don't change your colors around or your values, if you're pretty much copying what you see in front of you, that is pretty much the attitude of a camera. <laughs> so uh, that you're painting from life while you're painting literally does not mean that you're painting from life. Painting from life is more like looking at your life surroundings and, and uh, painting from your brain, cerebral painting, and just painting it. It doesn't mean that you have to be outside of your studio or anything like that. So my approach, even though I use technology as much as I can or as much as it doesn't harm me, um, my, I think it's very classical because I get all these uh, studies right, and yeah. drawings and make it. Uh, well, do, do, you, um, uh, do you paint from life? I mean... I uh, do. Oh, uh, yeah, I yeah, do. Uh, I'm going to uh, do it soon. Pardon? I'll be doing the demo. Well, you'll be doing it right away. <laughs> but I always, I, I force myself to do it because that's the only way. And I feel 
I want to make it clear for students that are beginning and have this and say, oh, photos, I, I love it. Caesar approved it, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. And what I'm saying is I never painted from photos when I was studying. In high school, studying art didn't, and in college didn't, and even in, at the Angel Academy didn't. I just use it now because it's, I just realized I don't have to do what the teachers told me or what the school told me. It's yeah. to my advantage. But if you want to learn how to describe form and to paint a uh, uh, good atmospheric um, impression, you have to study it from life. That's because that's what you have in front of you. Exactly. Otherwise, the photo is going to tell you what to do. And that's uh, not. I do not feel good. that photos often lie. All the time, like yeah. you see, you see it in courtrooms all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, of course they lie, and artists lie too. And I think that is the the beauty of art is distorting reality. Mm -hmm. If you if you copy what you see, is nobody cares. And people say it's like a photo. You don't say Rembrandt is like a photo or Caravaggio, right? No, no, no. That is because they lied about what they saw in reality. <laughs> and I think that's the beauty of it. You see the reflection of a mountain in the still water, in the lake, and that calls your attention more than the mountain itself. So we humans love these things that are similar, but not quite. Like black and white photography sometimes is more mm -hmm. intriguing than regular photo. And that's why we have Instagram with all these filters. So you yeah. change all these filters and make it more interesting. You don't want reality as a raw sense. Uh, so I think as an artist, that's what we do. We, we show an alternative to raw right, life. Right, right. Uh, now, uh, the artist, um, um, uh, Frederick Layton, Lord Layton, um, uh, he, he, in Almatadama even, used photographs. Uh, so he would uh, photograph his paintings and then look at the photograph and say, this needs to be, and then go paint from life to change it. Yeah. And then he'd photograph it again. Is that interesting? Have you ever heard anybody work that way? Yeah, I think Burrow did some of that too. Yeah, no? so uh, they had used photographs, but more as process, not as product. Exactly, you don't want, uh, you don't want the tools to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. For right. instance, if you learn how to do a straight line, you practice, you put the points together, and you kind of take your time and do a very straight line. Then you have a ruler, and that makes it easier, right? So you don't want a photo to solve the visual problems for you because it's already flat, it's a face, it's a background, so you just copy that. You don't want to do that. Yeah. So you want to be able to manage yourself so you don't have to depend on the tools. You can just control and use the tools, like brushes. What do you want to paint with your fingers? We invented brushes to help us paint better. So anything that you as an artist find that is important to the process, your process, then yeah. use it. But it's a personal thing. It shouldn't be a value thing that for everybody we make a rule, know this and know that. Right. For instance, projection. How many people have projected? People in the past projected, people in the present. But that is, and so people say, oh, they're cheating. I don't think so. I think they're cheating themselves if they don't know how to draw from life yeah. uh, and they do that, but you can see it. Nobody's gonna get a good painting if you don't know how to draw and yeah. you just project it outside. <laughs> so I, I think it's just like, you know, there's nothing ba uh, inherently bad in those things. It's just the way it's used. Exactly, you okay. See? Uh, now, now um, in the past, um, many great artists, um, when uh, they always had uh, people that they trusted to come and look at their artwork. Uh, for instance, um, uh, John Singer Sargent, whenever he would get a passage that is just a problematic, uh, he would call in Alma Tadema. And Tadema would say, hmm, okay, uh, do you have uh, uh, family or friends uh, uh, that would, uh, uh, or um, artists that you know? And they would say, uh, uh, you say, hey, I, I come take up my look. Uh, take a look at my work and, and uh, critique it for me. Do you ever do I that? I do, or? all the time, every painting, and that's my wife. Ah. <laughs> my wife, Valentina, it's in, well, I met her when I was starting the Angel Academy in Florence. Oh, just starting. So basically, she went through my whole program, uh, the, the bark drawings, the charcoal, cut, everything, I would take her in the studio, take her in the studio and show her the system, and, the, and I was so amazed by the way uh, we construct a painting. And she developed this vision and this eye. And if I'm sitting painting something, she passed by, she's like, I don't know, I will take a look at that eye over there or, or the hand is, and it's insane how she sees, I'm like, maybe nobody's gonna notice this. And I, as an artist, we all have lazy minds. Yeah. And, and sometimes you, you're tired, you're painting you know, the whole night. 
and you say, maybe that's okay. Man, Valentina comes in the morning and looks at it and say, what happened to that hand over there? And I'm like, got cut, I gotta go, please. <laughs> so uh, in subject matters too uh -huh. and, and areas like that, I'm so glad I have uh, an eye of that uh, quality to be uh, 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 looking for. Eye. Yeah. The outside eye is so important because um, uh, we do, we, we, we're, we're lazy creatures yeah. and so, you know, if it's good enough, it's good enough. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, you had mentioned uh, about a contemporary um, uh, 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 subject matter um, uh, that it doesn't do to, to look at the past and paint uh, the past. Uh, yesterday's subjects, yesterday's exact techniques, yesterday's exact vision. What do you see is the obligation of the artist to paint their day? They don't have their to paint, time. yeah. I, um, I don't think it's the obligation of the artist to paint their day or their time. I think it's the obligation of the artist to be aware of their day and the time and mm. to somehow uh, present it or go against it or something, but you cannot be asleep and say, I'm gonna do that because that's the comfortable way to do it and that's easy. They solve my principal problems, all my uh, you know, elements are there and I'm gonna use that to make my amazing paintings that my cousins love. You don't wanna do that as an artist. You want to challenge yourself and say, what, what is it? What is my situation in the world? How, why do I paint what I paint? And, and question it all the time. And that's what I'm, wondering and look at television and what it brings and cinema and theater and say, okay, I have these little things here, square canvas with paint. What can I do that is powerful? None of the famous artists we know painted mimicking the past. You know, yeah. Bugaro was influenced by Raphael. We don't see him mimicking Raphael. You say, you see the influence, you see the, you know, that, but you see how, how he took it to a different level. And that is my challenge uh, to, to look at the past think I'm gonna paint in the future so that when I paint it's just a present and it's contemporary. Exactly. Wonderful. Uh, how do you, uh, by what mechanisms do you keep interested in your own artwork? Now, you mentioned that um, uh, you're somewhat prolific. I mean, you have, you work very hard, you produce, um, but after X number of paintings, does it begin to be rote, um, routine? And, and you, and of course, routine is the death of an artist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you stay passionate about what you do? Well, I stay passionate by conversation. I, I, I look around, talk to different minded people, argue with them, fight uh, sometimes. Fight. Uh, peaceful fights. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boxing fights. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I make myself think about what I'm doing. So after a while of a series, developing a series of work, for a purpose, I'm researching, it's like a research, I'm doing this and what should I do to it? I've painted my paintings, uh, my recent paintings, the background has about like six layers, a complete cover, because I'm looking for something and I still don't get it. And I think is that uh, trying to achieve that which is unattainable, it's what keeps me motivated and, and, and looking for new things and new ways. So I don't take it as, yeah, I'm gonna paint this and tomorrow this and I know what I need to do. I don't even know what I like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I have that advantage. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Bird Jones once said, the, uh, he said, um, uh, between the last painting and the next one, I forgot how to paint. <laughs> I have to relearn how to paint. Totally, you know what? It's funny because now I'm gonna do a demo and I'm gonna use a, a system that I last week developed after copying a Buero and I think it's more advanced than my other approaches, even though I've taught the other approaches at some workshops. So I'm sure some students are gonna say, oh my God, you told me a different palette, or you told me a different uh, set of uh, colors or layers. And I said, I do that all the time in my work. No two fleshes I paint the same. I don't know <laughs> if that's well said, but I don't paint the skin tones or uh, my palette. I don't set it the same way every day. Yeah. So um, I think that keeps it new and, and fresh. And it's true, I forget it. I'm like, what am I gonna do today? Okay, I just approach the problem. And... Uh, have you noticed that um, uh, many of the schools teach um, um, uh, the ateliers, uh, they teach, let's say, uh, the painting of the grisaille, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, black and white and gray um, um, uh, painting of a, of a nude, let's say. 
and, um, and then, and then um, um, a student who graduate, uh, they leave school and, and they think that student practice is professional practice. Because some people buy it, so they... <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, people don't know. And he said, and underneath, I have a fully wrought um, um, a nude painting of a, of a woman. So he said, let's clean off that painting, get down to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, th I think art has to go beyond teaching and beyond um, school. If you can recognize where you studied clearly, you're just doing that. Like, you're not yeah. really yeah. finding your own voice. Mm -hmm. But that's what they taught you with the, were uh, the tools, so you can take that to a different level. But of course, it's so many people now can paint. Before, they had to either make a living at picking potatoes if you were not a good artist. You know, you had to decide. And now, we have such a luxury in our lives that someone can pay for your art education. You can get a loan, borrow money. So we have millions of artists <laughs> just painting uh, in, in these uh, academies or any, anywhere. So it's, it's, uh, we cannot say that everybody has to be a genius or uh, an amazing artist. All we can do is try to look at our history and see how we can take it to a new place. How, can take, how we can go beyond the pretty and the ugly and the schools. It's difficult. You have to think. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but that's what it is. Otherwise, people are right. Painters are lazy. <laughs> you, like, you learn how to do a cast and you just do a cast. Still life, still life. Arrange it, arrange you know? Yeah. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Uh, in the Soviet system, um, people would go to the Repin Institute and received the absolute best academic training in the world, mm -hmm. I think. Then when those artists graduated or, or, or finished their diploma, and they painted a diploma painting, and now they're in the world, not one painted academically because it was required of them not to because it, academic painting took a long time very careful, and therefore was only for the rich. And it was called... Um, 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 Formalism or... Noble, oh. uh, it was, uh, or bourgeois or whatever. Okay, and so, um, um, uh, so it's interesting how they're trained one way and they have their uh, professional practice. Really quite a different way. But the advantage was they, they, knew. they were one. They had control of their they tools. They had control. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas uh, uh, here we, uh, in, in our country, we deal with light and color. There they dealt with weight and form. But weight, who deals with weight in dealing with painting? But know? they study many years too. The thing is, like, oh, these yeah. academies are so short. Even four years is not enough from zero to four years. Like, that is not enough to master uh, that technique, uh, the technique of oil painting. So, I, and especially workshops nowadays, some people don't even go to the academies. They go to a couple of workshops and they try and they think they get it. And that's the difference between those painters or the past, that the whole life they were uh, practicing good m habits. So by the time they were free, they were, you know, real equipped with, uh, with that power of expression. Now we have people that are really uh, just learning what this teacher told them. And the teacher is not repping either. They're not Rembrandt either, you know. So you get accumulation of just lack of knowledge. And yeah, I think after school you have to keep studying and spend more years, the 10,000 hours of, pra of, 10, of quality pra practice, you know. <laughs> oh, now um, uh, you're having an exhibition coming up. Yes, um, uh, in how September. How often do you have exhibitions? One a year or every other year? Or? Every other year, more. Uh, yeah, I get prepared a couple of years and mm -hmm. then I have a show. But sometimes I am fortunate enough to sell paintings constantly, so I don't get to accumulate for a show. And sometimes people say, oh, the show is important and I enjoy being there and drinking and looking at my art all together. But it's a, a better feeling to paint and have someone appreciate it immediately and take it away from you. Um, and I think that's why I, ha I have had little shows, per, uh, solo uh, exhibitions. It's because I, don't, I, I sell them and I don't have them with me. If the Metropolitan wanted to have a show, would you oh, have, man, a, would you have a big show? <laughs> Totally. I'll call everybody that has my paintings. <laughs> yeah. I want your painting back. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy it from you. <laughs> now, how about a, um, um, a 35 year um, a retrospective at the Met? Oh my God, not yet. Uh, uh, well, well, maybe when I'm 80. 
No, no, no. Don't be embarrassing we'll now. <laughs> at 80, you'll have had five. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm, yeah, that'll be yeah, too much. Um, I don't believe I, you know, I belong to those type of settings yet. I'm, I'm developing. I want to, I would love to get there sometimes, but I, I try to be careful because I can make a mistake by showing it, uh, my, you know, my art somewhere that is too much for it, you know? Right. So you see your artwork as, as in its, still in its developmental state. That's how I find it. Every painting I paint, I'm like, man, no, the next one is going to be the best one. And, and then I don't like it anymore. If I, if I cannot sell it after six months, I just put it in storage or something or give it away or something because I don't oh. like it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to have one of your giveaway paintings. There you yeah. go. Yeah. 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 Now, now I, I've noticed that you have uh, painted uh, large expanses of uh, your canvas only to paint them out, sections of a mountain, and do something different. Um, because before, when I started doing these big paintings, I, want, I was too ambitious. And I got the photograph and I wanted to create the impression of a photo on purpose and break away from that classical training and say, we are surrounded by photography. I want to make a point and say, this is a photo of the person expression at that moment. And I want to paint it and tribute, uh, do, tribute that, you know, do a tribute to that. And, but suddenly I stepped back and the whole painting was too much. I had things that were not necessary. And I, and I thought, why do I paint things that are not adding to the story when the person's uh, um, face is telling me the whole story? So I got a brush and I just covered the background and stepped back and looked at the same, even stronger impression was achieved by avoiding things in the background. And then I did that to a couple of paintings and I thought that was the way. But then it was too plain then. I, I know this need more, more movement. No more. So that's when I got my left hand and some crayons and started drawing like a little kid, uh, <laughs> adding to it and becoming, you know, just uh, creative and sarcastic about it. And I stepped back and I said, this is amazing. This is, uh, I love this attitude of painting with my right hand, the best I can paint and then as clumsy as I could get with my left hand <laughs> and mixing those two together. And that's part of my, uh, concept in the previous series with syncretism. Right. So it's just uh, another way to see it, another way to look at it, more personal. And, and so it, it seems like uh, you've had the, uh, a series of paintings that um, um, uh, we, an academic part and then an introduction of some modernist, maybe a modernist painting in the ac otherwise mm -hmm. academic uh, work of art. And now this new series uh, are you still painting in this way or are you off on a new adventure to that yeah, right now? I'm just discovering okay. it. And, um, but that just seems like it's a, kind of the, the next step as you, as you march forward. Um, uh, what do you see in your future? I mean, in, in, in a crystal ball and you're gazing, what do you see as the next step and the next step or, or, or philosophically just kind of moving from a series yeah. to series or or you know, uh, lighting on something and then just perfecting that. Yeah, right now I'm so in love with what I'm doing that I think it's gonna be forever. And when people come and say, oh, I cannot wait what you're gonna do in the future. I'm like, really? I'm just like, this is the future. <laughs> this, no, I'm just starting with this. <laughs> so I, I don't, th I think I'm already doing something that was the future two months ago. And uh, you know, <laughs> so I don't, I don't have the ability to see beyond that. I'm just engaging in the present and trying to develop that now. And I, I hope it lasts forever and I discover new things within that, but I'm sure it's not gonna happen, it never happens. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't wanna be concerned with that uh, fantastical yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, even future. yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's good enough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, let me, let me revel in what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now I understand that um, there may be a book published on you in, in a couple of years, published by your wife. Uh, well, she has been writing my biography and not since we met, uh, she started getting points uh, that w have been tension or uh, success uh, stories and just marking them and writing them in order and what happens around that and deals I've met with Im important people and stuff. And I think uh, after, before it was just little text, but after 
10 years, it's just one cool thing after the other. And I think that was a good idea to do because now we have all these, uh, you know, writings with Writing? that we might have forgotten if we didn't put it in paper. Okay. And I hope uh, that will serve serve the future to just teach people or to show uh, more of my life how mm -hmm. it went. And it also solidifies your uh, reputation and your career because you want to have a career tomorrow as well as sure. enjoying it today and with an expectation that that tomorrow will be uh, a, a good tomorrow and um, uh, I'm sure you seem to have confidence that that uh, you know life will go on and you'll be able to uh, have a, a, a painting career oh I think I've had it because I came from nothing I had nothing and I always said I will make it and I I didn't have plan B and some artists call me and say, oh, if, do you think I'm going to make it as an artist? Oh, if you're thinking that, you're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> because I never thought about that failing point. And my present is the future of 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I said, would I make it in 2016 or 15, uh, being, living as a painter without just you know, having any other job? And, and it has happened. So I don't have to worry about that. I know that if I just do what I love, there'll be a way to, to survive, you know? Yeah, you know, my background is, is in academic painting, mostly. And naturalist painting with the Russian art. And, uh, uh, but your artwork is still yet to be categorized. <laughs> uh, you're you're kind of a little outside the box. <laughs> now, now, now you go, how does that make you feel? I mean, uh, uh, uneasy, uh, uh, proud, uh, uh, well, definitely, scared? Definitely. Uh, scared, because, but I think that is what my uncle always told me, to, you know, if people go here, you go there. That's my first attitude when I was in college was nobody knows how to paint here. I'm going to look for a place to go. So I went to Italy to study. So now everybody knows academy work. So then I go to back to the thing. So I, I always do that, but my life is like that too. I am, uh, you know, explosive and I change directions all the time. And I, and I don't, that's when you ask me about the painters, I find myself knowing very little about contemporary painters and what they do and what the auction houses do. I'm not concerned with that. And maybe that has affected my, my work in terms of, I don't know where I'm fitting because I'm not fitting even in my mind uh, with anything. So, I mean, I'm glad that you saw it like that. I think I feel proud that you said that. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you, you hate to think that uh, uh, you're plowing the same old field. You would like to uh, uh, open up new ground. And, and, and You lose friends with that, though, because <laughs> <laughs> some, uh, yeah, normally a lot of, um, because I did it, and that's why I say a lot of, but uh, painters, a lot of painters paint for their colleagues. And you find yourself in a group of people. You find com you find yourself comfortable within them, and you share ideas and principles about art. And I think that's dangerous. No two artists can be the same in that. Like you can be an impressionist, but you have to be against each other a little bit. Yeah. And say no, I don't think that's true. I think this. Is true. And yeah. if you want to stand out, because in art you have to impose your views yeah. until yeah. it works. Yeah. Look at uh, Picasso. Look at all these people. They said this is. Guys, this is honesty. This is me. This is real. And until people said, yes, I see it now. You cannot say, well, my friends, um, I don't want to be willing to agree with my, my, my fellow artists and, and do what they would like me to do. And I hope the, what they appreciate is that I love art and I, I love uh, uh, craftsmanship and, and technique. But they have to understand that you are yourself and you have to say stuff that even people don't agree, you have to say it. It is, imp it is the way in the arts. And, and uh, yeah, so I find myself out of any group. Uh, A social, little you know? bit outside. Well, there are some artists who paint outside the box, but you seem to say, there's a box? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a box. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, what amazes me about your work, uh, uh, Caesar, is that um, uh, my dear friend, uh, Fred, uh, Frederick C. Ross, Fred Ross in New Jersey, um, uh, he's a major collector of 19th century academic painting. 
and he is a major benefactor for uh, 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 thousands of young artists uh, like yourself uh, who are uh, at various uh, stages in their career. Now, I would have thought that you would be the last artist that Fred would, because he's very traditional, very conservative, just like me. You know, we're very close on that. And, um, um, and you would be about the last artist I thought I would like. <laughs> you know, but we have something in common. You see what I mean? I can conquer you and yes. Ross because I yeah. bring quality work. Uh, authenticity. Uh, and honesty. Yeah, no, totally. But also, I bring academic, uh, I, I rescue the classical yes. world in yes. terms of the visual effect has to be powerful and well made. And I want to make paintings that are well done, that everybody can enjoy it and say, okay, we don't argue about that. That is quality work. My kid cannot do that. That type of feeling. And I think that is what I, I do have uh, sincerely developed. And that's why I think I can uh, be appreciated by, by people with, you know, like right. you, who are, who are more purist. And, uh, and yeah, why not? Because, yeah. Well, yeah. If you have the quality and the talent and uh, the uh, honesty, I mean, we see that that, uh, and then getting to know you, we we we. It's only reinforcing what we knew already. But you struck our eyes, and we surrendered <laughs> to you. You see, because great art does that. But I agree with all. I mean, it's a surprise to me. Why? What's this? upstart doing I mean <laughs> well, you know. yeah and, I, and it's sad when people think that I'm just trying to be strange to fit into the contemporary art world that's sad because that's easy to judge but they don't know that what I'm doing is looking at my surroundings what do I do I go to CrossFit I have an iPhone I drive a car right? and I eat this and I you know so that's I'm painting my people why I'm being honest being honest is not saying, oh, my teacher told me that a girl looking at the window with a light in the face is what beauty is supposed to be, and I'm going to paint that. And I want to be weird to be in Art Basel. No, I, I'm an artist. That's what it is. That's yeah. what everybody did. Being eccentric is part, is the key to any major work of art. Rembrandt was eccentric. You're an art historian. Tell me a famous name that is, was not eccentric at his time. Art cannot be conservative. At that time, Bugaro was eccentric with his huge nudes. Come in, look at these amazing <laughs> girls naked. Wow, <laughs> never painted like that before. Larger than life size. <laughs> like, like, everything, even, even Ang was eccentric um, for his idealization of form. And Van Gogh, I mean, you name it, and I tell you, he's eccentric. Yeah, you talk about the physic your physicality and, um, and the gym and, and, and uh, your sports. Uh, and, and people will think that that's unusual for an artist because the typical stereotype of an artist is um, they're a little wimpy guy, uh, sallow, you know, at no muscles, they're thin, and, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're um, uh, backward, and they're um, inarticulate, and um, they're wimpish, mostly wimpish, and, and uh, they're not very good citizens, and uh, they're usually on drugs, and, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, you know, not realizing that they're describing modern artists. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, 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 but realists, That's funny. <laughs> but realists uh, are um, athletes. Whoa. In, this is what I've decided, an inordinate number of people who are professional artists have athletic backgrounds. You know, I mean, they played uh, professional, they played college, they played just club, uh, you know, they, or they're just individual. Uh, um, uh, they're quite athletic, uh, more so. They tend to be healthier. They, by the way, they live longer. Oh, by, uh, I did a study of several thousand uh, modern artists and, and, and realist artists of the same period. I did it with cowboy artists because that was a very closed system. Cowboy, uh, you know, Western painters of Indians and, and cowboys and, and cowgirls. <laughs> well, I think uh, painting is very physical. So you, I don't think it goes against it. If you're sitting down doing stuff, I don't know, but 
I'm, I'm standing up painting with my brush and holding the palette full of color for hours and hours. So hours. if I don't train, I think I'll be in pain by doing this. So, yeah. Yeah. and this type of art requires a lot of attention and a lot of health, uh, good health, and you have to be physical uh, about it. It's, you know, you're carrying something and... Uh, because you're using your body to paint. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 and it's all, to, in, uh, what are sports? You're a boxer. It's intuitive. Yeah. You know? You know, you're moving. It's that dance between the canvas and you and the distance. Yeah, yeah the <laughs> canvas. Is, and you're boxing that canvas. And sometimes um, it's tougher than some 250-pound uh, opponent. All the time. It's, <laughs> All yeah. the time. See, sir, um, uh, it's remarkable, uh, all the insights that you've given us in this last hour. Um, I, uh, I've learned a lot. I, I, I think people who watch this video will be well informed and will come oh, out uh, more understanding of, um, uh, of uh, the artistic method, um, uh, the truth. Uh, I think new things have come out. I I'm amazed at how much uh, you, you've said that you really kind of understand what, what has happened in, in, in um, uh, the art world uh, today. And, and um, uh, uh, maybe this is the future. Maybe uh, 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 you and, and others of your ilk uh, uh, would be the future. Um, uh, tell me, what does it feel like to think that uh, uh, you may be uh, a seminal artist that changes the way we think? That will be amazing because that's what I dedicate my life to. That's what I live for. So if that happens, then, you know, I want to cry right now. <laughs> yeah. But if that happens, you know, that is what I uh, surrender to every day. So if that ever happens, which probably not because we're, I believe um, we are just dust and we are not important. But, uh, but I do uh, work hard every day and I, and I look um, to understand my, my situation. And if I ever influence anybody that stands in front of my painting, that for me, uh, was the success that that was a successful uh, painting? So uh, it, everything else is not up to me, but yeah, it feels good to think about it. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you very much for talking to us about uh, what's important to you. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Bye bye. I hope you've enjoyed Secrets of Portrait Painting with Caesar Santos. You're going to love watching this one. It's 19 hours and you're going to get so much out of it. You can learn more at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes. Keep painting. Streamline Art Video is proud to partner with Art Renewal Center to bring you Secrets of Portrait Painting with ARC master artist and salon winner, Cesar Santos. In his early childhood in Cuba, Cesar, always interested in creative arts, built mud sculptures in the rain and used his imagination to invent toys. At the age of 12, after emigrating with his family to Miami, he dreamt of a future as an artist, even while participating in the sport of boxing and attending a magnet school for architecture. His first love was always fine art. After learning a contemporary view of post-impressionistic principles, Cesar wanted to add to his knowledge by understanding the scientific aspect of painting. He set off to the Angel Academy in Florence and then took that knowledge to meld what is now his unique and personal style, reflecting both modernism and traditionalism. Cesar is well known for creating portraits that reflect his passion for the unnoticeable yet irreplaceable people of his community. In this extended video, follow along with Cesar as he expertly guides you through each step of preparing, creating, and finishing a portrait painting. With his systematic approach, Cesar removes the difficulties many artists encounter when painting portraits. He'll show you proven techniques that he has developed through many years of his studies. It's always good to find out what the problem is. Sometimes we see problems and in our lives we do that a lot. That's a problem. That's bad. That's easier than finding how to fix the problem. So as soon as you find the solution, that is what matters. Whether you favor classical or contemporary, 
you will benefit from all Cesar offers in this video, where nearly every brushstroke is captured for you to see. Cesar is very comfortable working in front of the camera, and you'll find his playful yet serious style easy to learn from. His principle-based teaching methods are straightforward and practical, taking portrait painting, something that many artists find difficult, and making it much easier to learn and apply. All of this has the, the teeth inside the structure of bones. It's just a circular uh, shape that goes from side to side here, like that, and then from uh, top to bottom going like that too. Cesar breaks down the process for you into four stages, drawing and constructing, dead coloring, first painting, and second painting. Anybody can start a painting. The problem is to finish it with, uh, with detail and not lose the broadness of it. In each stage, Cesar will not only demonstrate what he routinely does in his own work, he'll carefully explain in detail why he does it this way and the advantages these methods have. So in this case, I put the white, light red, and a little bit of yellow. Mix it up to a nice flesh. I see, I see a lot of paintings having this line too thin at the end. Remember, that's something that is folding inward like that. So it has to have an area of darkness that is just, you know, before it goes totally inside the mouth. So make sure, make sure that this has some uh, width and height to it. You can then take this information and incorporate it into your own paintings in no time. Soon you'll be enjoying painting portraits more than ever. Watch as he skillfully paints a realistic portrait from start to finish, interpreting physical features and developing flesh tones with great precision. Because of Cesar's unique teachable talent, this video is appropriate and useful for all skill levels. The whole experience of just one painting is uh, really interesting and it, it looks for emotions within the artist. And now is the time to be precise and kind of like meditate into, into the, this world that you have created here. And that's the beauty of, of being an artist. The skills Cesar teaches are unique, yet universal and you'll find his techniques to be a natural way of building and creating portrait painting that you will be proud to show off. In this video, you'll also enjoy a showcase of Cesar's artwork, along with an interview of the artist conducted by Vern G. Swanson, Art Renewal Center trustee. Also featured is a musical composition directly inspired by the artist work from Brazilian composer Giacomo Lombardi. This video will become a treasure in your own resource library and you'll want to refer to it over and over as you master Cesar's secrets of portrait painting.